lecture. And uh, as you know, um, this morning's lecture, lecture is uh, Hao Shang from uh, Chinese Academy of Science. And he is telling us about um, nice things. <laughs> okay. Uh, please start. Hi. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank you, Professor Kawashima Sansei and also Professor Sunsuru Sansei for inviting me to this uh, uh, wonderful workshop. Um, in this talk, I'm going to give you an overview on the tensor level, the tensor level utilization for two plus one dimension um, or three, dim three dimensional classical systems. First, I'd like to thank my collaborators, um, Hai Jun Liao and Ling Wang. And they will come to this workshop next week. And also, uh, Rizhen Huang and uh, Ziyuan Xie, and also Bruce Norman. So, um, I will divide my talk into three parts. In the first part, I will give you a very general uh, introduction to the physical backgrounds. Uh, why should we do this uh, tensor network realization? And then I will discuss how to do this uh, essentially for, for example, for calculating a partition function, which can be either a partition function for three dimensional classical model or two plus one dimensional quantum lattice model. And in the third part, I will discuss how to treat a uh, uh, refunction, ground state function using tensor network methods. Um, so that's actually uh, what I'm going to do. Um, so the, the idea of a uh, minimization group was um, initialized by this uh, um, Swiss uh, uh, physicist in early 1940s, actually. Um, he submitted a paper to a uh, physical review and, uh, and it was uh, almost immediately rejected because no one could understand what he's talking about. Um, a few years later, uh, in 1951, he published another paper with uh, his um, uh, collaborator and, uh, in, uh, in a French journal, so not many people noticed that. And at the same time, um, just one year later, German and No and published their similar work on uh, on the realization group. That's actually the start of this uh, field. Um, the idea of this realization group was uh, used very broadly in, in the study of quantum field theory. I also achieved very successful uh, solve many fundamental problems. In the um, <clears throat> 1960s, middle 1960s, um, Kadalov uh, introduced the, the, the idea of a skinning transformation to their randomization group and used that idea to solve uh, the problem of phase transition and critical phenomena. Um, a few la years later, Wilson and uh, use their uh, idea uh, combined with uh, uh, dimension utilization and then provides a framework to calculate the exponents for the phase sensation or critical phenomena. In um, 19, in, in the middle of uh, 1970s, uh, still, Ken Wilson, and uh, he tried to combine the idea of this uh, uh, of the group with the idea of uh, uh, with uh, computational methods. Just uh, he designed, uh, he just uh, write a very short program on a um, calculator, and did this famous calculation. He solved this. Uh, Single impurity condo problem. Um, this I also think this is uh, uh, this is the first successful application 
of a numerical organization group method to a quantum running body system. Since it's just one impurity, so I always think that this is a zero-dimensional problem, zero-dimensional quantum problem. So after his uh, uh, work, quite many people tried to uh, generalize this idea to, uh, to a quantum lattice model. Unfortunately, not very successful until um, 1992, his half student, Stephen White, and invented DMRG method, which is now uh, the most uh, accurate method for studying a uh, one-dimensional quantum lattice model. So this is uh, the first step from zero dimension goes to one dimension. Of course, this method uh, works very generally. It may not just be one dimension. But uh, due to their uh, due to this, uh, due to their uh, limitation of this uh, algorithm, if you apply it to higher dimension, it cannot be uh, cannot treat a very large matrix. So in order to study a truly two dimension <coughs> system, we will try to generalize this DMRG idea to a tensor net organization to two dimension or higher dimensional systems. So the idea of uh, normalization group is actually very simple because the phase space we are studying is generally have a very uh, wide energy scale, scale. But the high energy, phase, high energy part generally has a very little uh, effect to the large physics we are interested in studying. So the idea we proposed <coughs> by this person is that uh, we first integrate uh, the uh, small part of the high energy part, and we hope to renormalize that, to use that to renormalize the Hamiltonian, so we get a uh, newer Hamiltonian, effective Hamiltonian. <coughs> then, by keep doing this, we can go to uh, eventually to an uh, effective Hamiltonian. And this is actually what we studied. Um, so this is a similar, similar, very simple idea. Then <coughs> this, this kind of formulism can be also uh, understood by doing scaling transformation. So we started from uh, um, a system which is, uh, looks very crude, uh, very crude, um, not a very accurate description, for example, for a function. We hope we do uh, some local transformation to refine the function. The idea here is very important, is to do local transformations, not global. Um, because global is very difficult. Then we hope by doing this, we can refine the function and eventually get a function which is accurate enough to describe, the, uh, for example, the states, the quantum states. Um, mathematically, this can be also understood yeah, by this formula. We have we can find a function. Oh, this should be n total, which is uh, which can be generally expanded using uh, completed basis states. So the n total number of basis states. But we hope to find a simple scheme of a finite number of basis states n, which is much much smaller than the total number of basis states to approximately represent this function. So that's the idea uh, when we do numerical realization calculation. So the, the, the real problem is that how to find this kind of basis state to represent this uh, function. So that's the, what we want to do. Um, physically, this is to do a uh, phase space compression. Um, if, I, if you are from a uh, mathematical side, if you're a mathematician, then this is nothing but to do a lower rank approximation for a matrix or a tensor. Um, if you are from uh, information science, uh, from that side, then this is uh, to do compression of information. So basically, this is uh, the idea. 
then when we ask whether a, con whether a quantum state is renormalizable or not. So as I mentioned, the function can generally be written as this way, You're using the total number or complete size, complete basis size to expand the refunction. For example, for uh, if that's not let's consider, for example, this uh, L by L lattice, then the total number, if we assume that each side has uh, two degrees of freedom, then the total number of base space is just this number. It grows exponentially with the system size. So what we want to do is that to find this uh, small number of n, as I mentioned, to represent the function approximate by this one. Then it seems that uh, the answer is yes, we can do uh, this compression. In other words, this kind of space, quantum space, is renormalizable uh, thanks to this uh, empirical area law of entanglement entropy. The entanglement entropy is defined by dividing a system into two parts, then by integral out, for example, this B pass then we can calculate the reduced density matrix of this A part. From A, this uh, reduced density matrix, so we can calculate their entanglement entropy. It turns out that entanglement entropy is scales just with the boundary size. And here, this for this uh, two-dimensional system is, uh, is, is roughly proportional to the, to the dimension of the system. Um, this area law, um, works when the system has a short range correlation. If there's a correlation between A and B, it's just short range. Then only the, the, the lattice, uh, the, 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 the size around the boundary has effect <coughs> on its uh, entanglement. This uh, is how this error law comes from. So if this is an error law holds, then the number of states we need is just proportional to this one. The log rhythmic, uh, log n is just proportional to this uh, entanglement entropy. So that's the minimum number we need. In this case, this n just scales, also scales with, uh, uh, with uh, a power, an uh, exponent of this L, but not L squared. So this is much, much smaller than this one. So that's the idea. Okay. The next thing, when we ask how can we determine those uh, uh, those basis states, the most important basis state, then the idea is actually to do an uh, experiment. This is term is uh, called as a DMRG experiment. It's measure the entanglement. This is like to do like, like to do a experiment like a pump and pop. In this case, we use uh, one subsystem to to probe the other side, other part of the system. So that's their, this is a quantity we measure. This is a reduced density matrix. Okay. That's the idea. So the importance of the basis states is determined by the, actually by the eigenvalue, eigenvectors of this density matrix. So this is uh, how the DMRG works. This idea can be also used to higher dimension. Of course, in that case, in, that case it's, um, in some cases, it's very difficult to define a positive definite density matrix. But nevertheless, this is still the idea one should use in order to determine the most important states. Um, there are many, many kind of functions that become, can be designed to satisfy the area. For example, in one dimension, the simplest uh, wave function that satisfies the area law is the so-called matrix product states. In general, in one dimension, the wave function can be writing it uh, using the local basis states. This is a complete wave function. It has uh, d to the power l uh, parameters. This is the total number of basis states the system can have. So this MPS is actually to approximate this wave function by a product of 
local tensors, okay, or matrix. So in this case, for example, this one, this is a uh, product of uh, many matrices. This matrix A, alpha, beta, and also M. This M is actually the physical degrees of freedom, so like this one. So here, this is I call this little d, is the total number base state on each physical solid. For this survey function, the total number of parameters is actually grows just linearly with the system size. So this reduces dramatically the total number of basis states. So this is a, this is a very uh, big approximation to this, fun uh, this function. The good thing is that this function is very low. Well. So um, there's a key parameter that controls accuracy of this function is the so-called virtual basis state number, number of bounded dimension. Or so in, in the language of uh, that DMRG is the number of basis states retained in the DMRG truncation of basis states. <coughs> so this is a, a, a approximation to this uh, many-body wave function. Um, when the bounded dimension D goes to infinity, in principle, we can find a very uh, oh, the exact ground state function. In 2D, then this uh, matching product space is, uh, uh, can be represented as uh, uh, so this so-called project entangled pair state. Okay. This, this kind of state was first introduced by those uh, two German scientists and later reinvented by researcher and Schrock. Um, this, one, this name was uh, named after uh, by, by those two people, like Rosetter and Shark. So this stays emphasized on the, uh, the, the, the entanglement between two nearest neighbor sides. And they assume that the entanglement between the two sides are maximally entangled. So that's uh, why this is called a pair entangled state. Okay. Um, this kind of state is also, this kind of representation is the exact representation of this uh, so called valence bound solid state, um, this is, which is also the ground state of the two dimensional AKRT model. There are also other kinds of uh, 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 two-dimensional uh, function that can also satisfy the entanglement error law, which is uh, called uh, PASS, uh, Project Entangled Simplex State, which is to replace this uh, pair by simplex. Um, this uh, this of state emphasizes on the entanglement uh, inside uh, simplex. For example, for this uh, Kagomi lattice, uh, for example, a triangle, a small triangle is a, is a simplex. Of course, a simplex can be uh, more than just three sides. You can also combine, for example, three or four triangles. Uh, you can take in this as a one uh, simplex. So you can enlarge the cluster. So this is a more like a clusterized uh, project entangled uh, states. Okay. Uh, for example, just for this state, if we compare this one, well, for this, uh, this uh, tensor, uh, the local tensor has five indexes. But, but this one, now each size has only three indexes. Okay. There's a, this is this, we call this a simplex tensor, which has uh, no physical degrees of freedom, uh, but has uh, three internal MAC. So it's a rec three tensor. And also, there's a projection tensor, which is a very like a one-dimensional uh, message plus space, which also has three indexes. Again, it's a rec three tensor. So this will function uh, is uh, has much fewer parameters than this one. 
<coughs> in principle, is easier to treat. So this is kind of our um, uh, state is also an exact representation of a state called simplex solid state, which was initially introduced by uh, Professor Arroas um, in 2008. Um, this state also emphasizes on the uh, entanglement among a simplex, which is at least simplex. Um, she is assumed that the state form a maximum entangled state. That is like each site also represents for the site in the origin lattice? That's right. This is a Kagami lattice. Let me just say. If we compare with this one, the physical side is still uh, on this uh, the vertex of the tri each triangle. But here, there's extra tensor, which is a completely internal tensor. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in the like in the center of the triangle, there's another tensor which is not identified. <coughs> that's what, not identified. Can, you can also rational change the tensor. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they are not identity. If it's identity, of course, this uh, <laughs> uh, has no use. Okay. And also, the tensor narrow states also form a faithful representation of, uh, uh, of, of a party function, of a generational function, function of a problem system. Um, here I just give you an example. For example, for uh, actually this uh, this uh, argument works in any dimension for almost any kind of uh, <coughs> quantum or classical models um, with short range interactions. For example, this uh, IC model, two dimensional IC model, defined on square lattice. Then we can write write down the partition function. Okay. This partition function, because it's classical, then we can express this partition function for the whole system as uh, uh, this Boltzmann weight as a product of a local Boltzmann weight. So this is a uh, this dark square. Uh, it's just this blue square here. Then this Boltzmann weight actually it can be written as a tensor, full index tensor. This is very simple. You're given this uh, SI, SJ, SKL, this is their local physical degree of freedom, then you define tensor. So this is simple. Okay. And of course, the difference is that uh, here, this tensor is now because uh, this is just what's in the weight. So that's, uh, this is uh, uh, not a version of parameter, it's uh, already predetermined tensor. Unlike in for the uh, matrix product space, in that case, each matrix is <coughs> a rational parameter. So the um, tensor network representation is actually quite uh, general. There are two ways or two kind of approach that can be used to study a quantum system or classical system. One approach is to directly calculate a partition function. So I here I call it partition function per approach. It's basically treat is to contract the whole network directly. Okay. So you just directly <coughs> calculate the partition function. Of course, this can give you all the physical quantities, for example, thermodynamics or any other kind of quantities quantities that can be deduced from partition function. As I mentioned, initially this log tensor is uh, is predetermined. It's not a, a version of uh, changed. There's another way is to uh, instead of uh, uh, contract the whole network Directly, then we calculate uh, 
to do a projection onto a boundary uh, tensor narrow states. So this is uh, quite many people use. This is actually also the DMRG use. It's to, instead of uh, to calculate uh, the partition function itself, we calculate um, the ground state. Okay? This is to project the whole lattice effectively onto the boundary. So that's what we did. But with the projection, of course, uh, this reduces uh, this two-dimensional system into a one-dimensional space. So there's a two-dimensional lattice and tension error. Then we convert uh, a problem which solve a two-dimensional uh, quantum network into a one-dimensional quantum network. So this could reduce the cost in the calculation. So that's the reason why we reuse this kind of things. But by doing this kind of things, this wave function, this becomes a wave function which should be rational determined. So this has become a rational parameter now. It's not, instead of uh, uh, determined from the beginning. Now let me just uh, first tell you how to do this uh, uh, how to calculate the partition function. Uh, there are many, many approaches that have been proposed, have been uh, introduced in the past uh, more than 20 years. Why is uh, this kind of uh, for two uh, for, for two dimensional system, or one plus one dimensional system? Uh, basically, there are two kind of approaches has been used. One is Many based on this kind of DMRG approach. Okay, for example, uh, TMRG, the Transfer Matrix Minimization Group method, which was uh, first uh, uh, introduced by Nishino for classical system. And also, can one can also use a color transfer matrix minimization group method, again introduced by Nishino um, in 1996. Uh, another approach is to, uh, to do direct projection using massive, massive products states. This is the method first introduced by Riddell, and people also call it uh, TEBD. Okay, so that's the method. Um, another kind of method is uh, basically to do scaling transformation or cost screening. This kind of approach was uh, first introduced by Nevin and Nave in 2007. Um, in that work, he introduced this uh, so-called uh, TRG method, tensor transition group method. Okay. And later, then we refined this method by, <coughs> um, uh, by introducing uh, further realization uh, considering, uh, considering the interaction between the a local tensor and, and an environment tensor. We call this a second realization group method. And later we also introduce a, a, a tensor a SVD, that's just a higher order single value decomposition method based TRG method, we call it HOTRG method. And in recent years and uh, a number of uh, variations of this kind of TRG method was introduced by, uh, for example, uh, Yunbri and Vidal, and also by So Yang. And those two approaches uh, were, were uh, extremely good at a critical point. So then, then let me just uh, uh, tell you uh, briefly uh, about the idea of cost screening uh, TRG, okay? Um, this method um, just uh, uh, works in two steps. The first step is to rewire this, uh, for example, this high lattice into this uh, uh, dichroic triangle lattice by doing a uh, very simple Mathematical transformation. This is mathematical transformation. It's just single value decomposition. In this case, by 
contracting two Natchez sites or two local tensors. Then one define a, a new tensor, just one site tensor, but by um, combining their lower two indexes as one index as a matrix, and an upper one, then do a um, single divided composition. This is a, a cartoon, and which is next to uh, change this uh, uh, to a local tensor into these two local tensors. By doing this, one can convert this uh, lattice into this one. So this is uh, just do a simple single order differentiation. Then the second step is actually to uh, to contract each, each triangle internal bond, then when define new tensor. So by doing this, we can <coughs> reduce this uh, high commonalities to this one uh, by reducing the, the size. So, so the lattice go, goes back to the high commonalities, but the total number of size is uh, reduced by a factor of three. So that's all I'll share. Uh, a very simple idea. Of course, when you do this decimation, then we need to truncate this uh, this uh, thick uh, bound because the bound that I made here is a thick bound is d squared. If the original one, original bound that I made is d, then this is d squared. I keep doing this uh, each time is squared. So then in this case, we need to truncate this. The truncation is done by uh, based on this uh, singular values. So the smallest singular value is discarded. We just retain the, the largest singular values. So that's the idea. Um, then you may ask how good this kind of method can, can be. <coughs> For example, for this uh, <coughs> uh, two-dimensional SE model, if we keep 24 states, then that's uh, the relative arrow of the free energy. Um, it's a 10 to minus 1. Seems good. Okay. Not too bad. Um, if I go back to here, then you will see that this kind of optimization is clearly just a local optimization approach. Okay. So it's not a globally optimization approach. Um, in order to construct a global uh, optimization approach, we need to consider just not just the two sides, but also the whole lattice. So if we call this as a system, then the, the rest of the tensors are just the environment to this system. What are we really uh, we are really interested is actually to this trace. This, uh, this M, this is a system tensor, and the rest of the tensor is called environment tensor. What do we really, what do we really need to optimize is in fact the, these products, not just their M. <coughs> so in this case, uh, we need to find a new approach to optimize the truncation, or to, to minimize the truncation error. But we call this the secondary realization group method. So in principle, this is a global optimization approach. Um, then people may ask, how can we do this? Here, the most important thing is to calculate this environment tensor, which is the, the whole uh, partition function uh, except that there are two tensor missing. So that's the only thing we need to worry about. Uh, it turns out uh, this can be, the environment tensor can be, for example, be approximate package using TRG, using a local optimization approach. For example, using the same scheme I told you before, then this uh, environment tensor can be changed to this uh, decorated uh, triangle lattice with two, with here, just uh, some bond missing. So that's actually like 
I mean, by keep doing this, in principle, one can found the uh, on the environment tensor. Environment tensor. Um, this is actually one step. How can we realize this uh, uh, environment tensor? So this is an original environment tensor. Okay. Then by one step, very we get this one. By contraction, by that contraction is a each triangle. Then we get this one. Okay. This one looks not very like this one. Okay. They are not exactly the same. But if we divide this or uh, oh, cut this part, just this middle one, cut this part from this one, then we get this one. So this uh, um, this one looks uh, have a roughly the same structure as this one, except uh, the net size is reduced by a factor of three. Uh, of course, you need to rotate it by uh, 90 degrees. Okay. This one is the same as this one. Okay. So they have a, we can get a um, recursion form for medicine. Just this one. So this one, just here, and this one, it's a this one. Okay. Then this is the four S product, <coughs> just this one. Just this little one. So this is actually um, give us a, a recursion formula. Um, now I suggest that we can first calculate uh, this uh, the outermost environment. Then goes back to the, the original one. Okay? Instead of doing calculation, to do the calculation this way, from, from this side to, to here, we do the calculation from, from the utmost uh, environment. This is, uh, um, sorry, okay. okay. So this is, um, I call this uh, back propagation. This is uh, from, from the uh, <coughs> outermost one, and then goes to the original one. So this is actually, namely, we, we, if we know this one, we can use this formula to calculate this one. So this is, uh, this is actually very similar, I should say, very similar to the, out, uh, to the back propagation in automatic differentiation. So this is actually quite a uh, new technique that is used in machine learning. And also recently we tried to use this method to do to optimize uh, the algorithm of uh, tensor network realization. So and anyway, I should say this kind of <coughs> idea is very similar uh, to the back propagation in automatic automatic differentiations. Um, later, I will briefly tell you how this works. Okay. And then, let me make a comparison. This is the, the uh, result I showed you before. This is the original TRG method. If we consider the uh, second organization uh, to the system, or this is the globally optimized <coughs> approach, then indeed, the accuracy is improved. All right. Um, <coughs> here, the Paul um, Paul Man's SRG is um, maybe I can tell you uh, after my talk. I might take a minute or longer time. Okay. Um, the, the the idea is that uh, uh, because in order to calculate this uh, environment tensor is it takes uh, uh, it cost is relatively high. So we we just try to find a very simple scale. Uh, instead of calculating uh, the whole <coughs> contracting the whole tensors, we assume that each bond linked to this environment, we assume there's an effective field here, just on each bond linked to this environment. This is like a take a mean field approximation. Okay, then we assume that there's a, 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 a there is. Um, 
uh, effective uh, field on each bond. That field is actually entangled spectrum. Uh, where this is the approach we use for simple update. I will, I will discuss uh, this later. So from there, you can understand what I mean by an uh, effective entanglement in the field for summation. Okay. How are you getting the, the ground truth? Uh, are, what are you comparing this? Oh, this is because of this, uh, uh, this is a two-dimensional system. IC model is exactly oh, soluble. Okay. So we have an uh, exact expression. This so is for a, for a finite system size? Or uh, for finite or for infinity. OK. Yeah. This is there for infinity system. Okay. So Peripher just showing that the cusp that behavior corresponds to the trans trans This is a critical trans point. Trans yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. So um, you can determine the critical point from this uh, uh, from the, 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 the peak point. Of course, uh, in real calculation uh, for an uh, unsolvable system, you do not exactly the function of free energy. In that case, you have to determine this critical point from other uh, quantities. Now let me just make a further comparison. Um, for example, if we compare with, uh, 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 for example, the TMRG, okay, or DMRG, okay, basically, or CTMRG, or ITVD. This is uh, the result I showed you before. This is a TRG. This is a roughly, uh, this is actual TRG. This one, I, I didn't discuss this method. And then this is a uh, SRG or actual SRG. But if we compare with, um, for example, CTMRG or ITVD, then the error bar is basically zero for machine error, okay? Uh, except at the critical point. Even it, just at the critical point, the error bar is still smaller if we just use uh, CTMRG or ITVD. Okay. So if we just want to calculate uh, the thermodynamic quantities, actually, this two measures works much better than other methods. <coughs> okay. And uh, of course, at the exactly at the critical around the critical point, if you want to analyze critical uh, exponents of uh, critical dimension, then in that case, this kind of method um, may be. Uh, is more convenient to use because uh, from this quantity uh, you can directly deduce, for example, the, the critical <coughs> components and other quantities. But it, if you are just uh, interested in the thermodynamic quantities, actually for for one plus one dimension or two dimensional classical system, I just suggest you just use TM, uh, CTMRG or IGBD or this kind of method. Okay. There's no, uh, this, this kind of uh, cost screening approach actually doesn't give you a better result. So, do you have any comment about the computational cost? The computational cost, uh, this too, also is much smaller than this, this uh, cost screening approach. Okay. So, in that sense, I just suggest you, if you just consider, for example, one plus one dimension. Oh, two plus uh, two dimensional classical system. If you are just interested in the thermodynamic calculation, then that's two approach I suggest you to use. If you are interested, in not more than that. Just uh, I want just calculate at the exact the critical points to calculate, for example, exponents or other kind of just critical <coughs> properties. Then this kind of cost screening approach can be used. That may generally uh, uh, can give you directly a measure of quite many different quantities. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Why 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 full screen algorithm is faster than the uh, ITVD or CTA multi approach? Um I think just because uh, in this kind of things um, for this kind of uh, approach, a cross-grain approach, the error is cumulative. 
actually very, very respectful for uh, when you do the cross screening. But if you, for example, use uh, ITVD to do a projection, you don't care about the, the accumulation of the error. Okay. But uh, the number step is uh, bigger. But uh, every time you, you just start from new starting point, then you don't know where you don't care about the error uh, before. So we just start from new states. So only the last step, the error bar is 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 important. Okay. So there's no no error accumulation. At, uh, when you do use this kind of methods. But, but I, I think in the case of it's already like, yeah. I thought you, uh, you uh, maybe you optimize the whole stage of the normalization. Yes, yes. So I, I maybe feel that there is more activation. Yeah. Um, you, in that, you, you, yes, but uh, uh, the, the trouble is that uh, if you use the SRG, and uh, the combination error can be reduced. Okay, it's not a completely re uh, just uh, because uh, the, the reason that SRG has some error is just because uh, the environment tensor, with their calculated environment tensor using the, 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 the local optimization approach. So if that environment tensor can be calculated exactly, of course, yeah, you are right. Yes. So is it possible to extract the critical exponent from the conversion of MCS? Uh, in principle, yes, but it's very complicated. Okay. So, uh, not actually, not many people are trying to do that. Okay. Because uh, uh, in DMRG, uh, <coughs> uh, generally the net size increase is just by one side. So, that's a very slow uh, scaling transformation. Okay. So, the, the change is too small. Uh, that change may not give you a very uh, good protect of the critical uh, scaling behavior. Now you may ask uh, whether this kind of approach is uh, really useful, okay, so this kind of approach. Uh, actually, it is useful only when, if we want to consider the uh, system which is a 2 plus 1 dimension, or 3 dimension system. Because almost all this kind of approach here introduced, and also most of the approach introduced here, cannot be easily used in 3 dimension, or 2 plus 1 dimension. Okay. Yes, principle every method can be extended to 3D. But either cost is too high or the method may not really work very good in three dimension. It turns out uh, this is a uh, this is the method which can be relatively easy to extend to three dimension. Okay. So this is a uh, we call this so called as uh, HO TRG method, which is a very simple method based on the uh, higher order single variable decomposition of a, of a tensor. Um, all other methods works only in one plus one dimension or two dimensions. So, so. Okay. But this method, so I ever tell you. Uh, later, uh, it's actually a method that can be extended to three dimension. So let me just tell you uh, uh, how this uh, HOTRG works. So this is HOTRG, okay? Actually, it's even simpler than TRG itself. For example, let's consider square letters. Over here, I discussed uh, about a uh, uh, two-dimensional system, as an example, but uh, the idea can be extended to 3D. Um, basically, we just uh, <coughs> contract two sides, two tensors, okay? Then they form a, um, <coughs> a new matrix, which is, uh, this is four by four, this is a two by four matrix. Of course, by contracting these two sides, the bundle dimension along this horizontal direction is squared, okay? So in order to reduce the bound dimension of, of this horizontal bound dimension, we take a higher order single value decomposition, okay? <clears throat> this is a very standard uh, technique of, uh, uh, for a tensor, which is uh, just a very simple extension 
of the singularity composition of a matrix, you just extend that matrix from matrix to a tensor. Okay? So that's this is called higher order singularity composition. Um, by doing this, <coughs> we can just reduce uh, this tensor to this one um, by cutting the bond dimension from d square to d back to d. Okay. So, so that's a, a very simple step. Um, <coughs> It's also very easy to code this kind of uh, uh, transformation. Okay, so you uh, just call uh, <coughs> write down a very simple uh, SVD version of a tensor instead of a matrix. That's the only thing we want you to do. So the <coughs> the first step is to do uh, <coughs> for this uh, four index tensor. This is two. Uh, Combine just a just single this is one index. This is a four index tensor, and then one do uh, uh, this actual SVD, okay, higher order single variety composition, using four unitary matrices. This is U, uh, L, U R, U, 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 and U D. Okay, it's four U indexes, uh, uh, unitary matrices. Um, this uh, in in the matrix. Um, uh, singular value decomposition, this is uh, S, is just a diagonal matrix. But here, you cannot diagonalize it. It is still a uh, tensor, but it has a very spe a special structure. It alters uh, in some way, then means that uh, <coughs> first, uh, for example, <coughs> D, uh, for each index, the first D uh, states has a larger weight, then the rest of it has a lower weight, then you discard that kind of lower weight uh, spectrum. So this is a uh, like to just uh, to contract a bond dimension along this direction. And doing this, uh, one can convert this one into this one. So this is the second step, it's just uh, do a very simple uh, Contraction for the for the for this uh, horizontal bound, just this one, just this, just this uh, asymmetric matrix. Uh, of course, uh, the the method I've told you is also a local optimization approach. One can also globalize it by calculate environment tensor, the contribution of the environment. This is a secondary normalized actual TRG method. Okay, so we call it actual SRG. So this is a the inver this is a environment tensor because we just uh, uh, cut uh, the middle uh, two sides. Again, this kind of uh, environment tensor ca can be calculated uh, by, uh, for example, using actual SRG, actual TRG. Um, Where is the back? <coughs> anyway, um, this is um, another way to to show this kind of uh, uh, tensor structure. Uh, I call this as a Lichino plot because uh, this is how Lichino. Uh, Um, this is a plot because uh, the middle one, this is the original two tensor. Then this is a uh, uh, this is a unitary transform. Uh, this is an isometric matrix. This is U, U one. This is obtained by HLTRG. You get uh, this is a T new T one. Okay, but this is a T one. You can repeat this kind of thing. So you get here. Uh, this two, this uh, two things, uh, you have to get is uh, U two, okay. Then from this U two, you get uh, is T two, then U three, then T three, okay. Anyway, this is another way to represent this kind of uh, 
square values up to there. You can, from this, you can see the, 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 the hierarchy of local tensors. Um, so basically, this is a, how is a T, uh, a T uh, local tensor is performed. Okay. So there's a two uh, local tensors combined together and do a transformation of truncation by this U unit, uh, by this uh, isometric uh, tensor U, then get a, a new tensor in the next stage. Here we have another a parameter here, this is C, I call it CN, this is a normalization, is a normalization constant. Because uh, if we do this kind of many more times, then eventually the function or all this tensor will blow up or either shift to zero or goes to infinity. So we have to renormalize it every step. Then you see this uh, normalization constant, actually free energy can be written this way. This free energy. So n is that step of normalization step. Um, in principle, one can regard this u simply as version of parameter. Okay? Because uh, when I do uh, this actual TRG, this u is determined by the uh, actual SVD. Okay? But here, if I just write in this way, I don't care about HOTRT, okay? I don't care about HOSVD. We can simply regard this U as version of parameter. Then in principle, one can minimize this free energy by optimizing this U matrix. We don't care about it, whether it is unitary or, uh, or isometric, which has noise matrix, okay? So why? Do we need to minimize this free energy? Because free energy, when you minimize it, that's actually a global minimization approach. Okay? That's a truly minimization approach. Okay? <coughs> right? This is very likely you minimize the tensor, okay? Or, or PEPs. When you, when you determine the PEPs, then you just minimize that. Okay? So, in, but in the case of ground state, uh, so, yeah. Okay. That's the same. Okay. The same, okay? But here, the only thing is that this U is a version of current. Okay. If you do that way, then you can get uh, the optimized free energy. Okay? Actually, I will try that. This is indeed works better. <laughs> okay? Now, maybe his question is about uh, what kind of a variational principle this is. No, this is, a free, this is free energy. Is actually the, this gives an upper bound of free energy. I see. So you okay. can prove that that, that, that that satisfies the. Uh, because uh, this is a uh, this is just a basic transformation. It doesn't introduce any unphysical things. Mm -hmm. So it's a satisfied version of principle. Okay. Anyway, this method can be extended to 3D. That's actually the the most important message I want to to bring to you. Because uh, this is, for example, this uh, uh, three-dimensional system, one can contract uh, this uh, two-layer uh, system into uh, one layer, okay? <coughs> By contracting uh, two sides or two tensors along the vert vertical direction. Okay. Then, of course, by doing this kind of things, and one can do uh, uh, this uh, show SVD and to determine its uh, uh, transformation matrix, then by, by doing the bound dimension count, then one can get a new tensor here. Okay. So this is actually very simple, easy to implement in a computer. And this actually also works. Um, quite, quite, quite good, okay, quite well. For example, this is for three-dimensional SM model, I just showed you. This is a comparison uh, between the actual TRG result, okay, this is one, with Monte Carlo, okay. The, this is by keeping uh, 14 states, sorry, 
B is 14. And then you want to say, there almost no difference between the two results. Of course, there's some, okay? This is a, this is a difference. Here you can say uh, a little bit uh, deviation, but uh, the relative error is uh, <coughs> to minus five. This is for the magnetization. Of course, here you can read out uh, critical points. I believe that for fixed fundamental the, yeah. the uh, critical point, critical temperature, yeah. it won't take to the main paper, like behavior or critical exponent for very vicinity of. Yeah, this, uh, from here, from the, from the uh, temperature dependence, yeah. uh, we can estimate this uh, the exponent beta here, yeah, for yeah. example. And this is a comparison yeah, between yeah. different methods. So Basically, they agree with each other. So, wh why so accurate uh, this calculation? Because uh, I naively feel that mm -hmm. so B equals 14, so small. And yeah, so 14. Yeah. Ah, so, for example, population X is also large. Yes, you're right. So I, I, don't, I don't really understand why it works so good, but uh, it happens that <laughs> <laughs> to the calculation. Surprisingly, we found that it works quite good for this very simple model. In the case of 2D, yeah. the 3D is, uh, 2D is more far from uh, mean field. So yeah. if you apply the same approach to a 2D IT model, yeah. the accuracy of uh, this... Oh, for 2D, the so accuracy is even higher. Okay. Higher? So it is a little bit uh, lower, but uh, still good enough. Okay. Then this is a uh, free energy. Oh, sorry. This is our uh, internal energy. Sorry, this is internal energy. This one, uh, because there uh, are color results. And uh, this is with the heat. Okay. Then compare with uh, this uh, solid line is their uh, variation of color results obtained from the screen. You can also say this is agreement with. Uh, it's two kind of approach, uh, quite good. So how much is the size in the Oh, this is uh, because every time we shrink to the lattice size by two, so when we do the calculation, it's basically infinity. Uh, Monocolo is a uh, very, I forgot, it's about, uh, it's quite a big. Could it be just uh, uh, 1,000 cubic, something like that. Uh, it's quite a big uh, lattice. Anyway, from this, I'm uh, oh, sorry. From this kind of uh, divergence or the, the point here, we can read out the uh, temperature, where the critical temperature. So that's uh, the result we obtain. For example, by keep D equal to 16, we get this number, converge to the number. We don't know whether this is exact or not. We just say how many number to converge. Then when we increase the D to 23, then we get to this number, okay? Um, it agrees with the uh, monocolor results, quite good, okay? Well, of course, we can, we, we can use the other kind of approach to, to, to even get a better result. Anyway, this is a very simple approach, already give us a result. Uh, I think it will create uh, almost the uh, most accurate method for first time three dimensional asymptote. Mm -hmm. One can also use this kind of method, for example, to study a uh, two dimensional quantum system. For example, when it's a uh, transverse asymptote in 2D. Okay. One can also, for example, calculate their zero temperature. Uh, magnetization and say the phase diagram, for example. Then uh, if your transverse field is very high, of course the magnetization on the z-axis is zero. Okay. Then there's a phase transition uh, around the three point something, this value. Then we see a phase transition. 
Um, let me just say this uh, there's a jump, of course, but uh, if we increase the bound dimension, then generally, or increase the point, more points here, you can see the more points generally goes through here. So from that kind of analysis, we need this is second order visualization. Um, this is, uh, again, this is a D equal to 14. And uh, if we measure the magnetization on um, uh, X direction, then this is the curve. Okay. This is quite accurate. We do not have very exact results to, for, to compare, but uh, just uh, from this curve, we believe it's, it's quite uh, accurate. And this is uh, also the, uh, is, uh, as a function of temperature, okay? because you, as I mentioned, one can also calculate the thermal dynamics. Then from that, you can also calculate the internal energy, for example, as a function of uh, fields, uh, as a function of temperature at different fields. Or magnetization uh, as a function of temperature at different fields. Okay? So you can read out uh, the critical temperature for given uh, uh, external field. Anyway, so this is a kind of approach one can use, to, for example, to study thermodynamics of two dimension on the United system. So in this case, did you use like ATO or SRG? Uh, ATO TRG. TRG. Because uh, to, to use SRG to refine this uh, takes a uh, long time, so we didn't do this. Okay, so I just uh, <coughs> tell you how to directly <coughs> evaluate uh, the partition function itself, okay? Because from partition function, in principle, you can read out all kind of uh, thermodynamic properties. Also, uh, even you can go to zero temperature for quantum system, also for classical system. Now let me just... Um, um, Okay, another kind of approach that has been used, broadly used in the study of two-dimensional quantum system, which is a refunction approach. Um, in this case, we rely on this kind of uh, tensor network ansatz for refunction. Okay? So all the local tensors are version of parameters. So in this kind of approach, this is a basic approach for studying uh, ground state. It can be also used to study, for example, to calculate uh, dynamic quantities, but uh, it's quite difficult. But, uh, so it, um, here I will, I will only discuss about the calculation for the ground state. So this is a wave function we use. And this is a version of local tensor. Okay? So in this kind of approach, we first need to determine this local tensor. Okay? Then from this wave function, we should also calculate physical quantities. So that's two steps. Um, of course, in order to de determine this quantity, generally, we have to evaluate this kind of thing at each step of optimization. So this is, um, uh, these two steps are not independent, as you say, because in order to optimize this key, we need to calculate uh, some kind of, for example, uh, energy. If we want to minimize energy, in order to determine this uh, tensor, local tensor, we need to minimize energy, then we need to calculate this quantity every step of optimization. So that's actually uh, two things. Then let me first tell you how to obtain this uh, tensor. Okay. Key. Um, there are two kinds of approaches. One is based on the projection approach, which is to start from an uh, arbitrary initial wave function. Then we apply this projection operator onto this uh, uh, onto this uh, tensor nerve space, we get a newer tensor nerve space. Okay. 
So in the limit, so this, uh, uh, if we apply this uh, project operator many, many times, then we should get to cross the nature. So that's the, uh, um, the idea. Um, in this kind of projection approach, there are two kind of uh, scenarios. One is called mm -hmm. self-update, one is called full update. This simple update is actually nothing but uh, entanglement mean field theory or approximation. This kind of approach <clears throat> and works very fast and it can treat a very large bound dimension. Okay? So the bound dimension, one can easily reach bound dimension d equal to 100, okay, for example. Um, this kind of approximation is actually an exact solution of this kind of uh, tensor of states on the basal lattice. Okay. Uh, this approach is uh, more accurate than this one because uh, we do not take the kind of uh, mean field approximation, but the cost is much higher. So in this case, this bound dimension is generally is very difficult to go beyond 10. Um, also, this kind of approach um, I often trapped at some local minimum. Okay? So in, 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 in the case of zip blocking, there is no local minimum problem. No. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. It is a local minimum, okay, seriously, because this is a basically a local approximation. So in that sense, uh, uh, there's no global minimum. It needs a rich uh, no minimum. So um, there's another approach is to optimize this uh, wave function or tensor just by minimizing this quantity. Okay. Again, here a number of approaches can be used. One can also use simple simple update to minimize this one. Just take a mean field approximation. Okay. One can do this. Um, of course, in this level, this is actually two approach actually give you the same answer. They are not different. Either if you use projection approach, you can find the wave function. You can also use the external approach to find the wave function. Okay. They get the same uh, local tensor. Uh, in literature, most people use this kind of approach, variational minimization. Okay. Um, it turns out that this is a, this method works, but generally cost is very high. Okay. Um, a requirement of this kind of approach is to use automatic differentiation. This can this kind of approach, I will discuss a little bit later. Uh, it's much, works much simpler than this one because you don't need to write down many, many uh, uh, very tedious codes in order to do these kind of things. And also, this kind of approach gives you a much more accurate estimation for the gradients. That's actually, when you're doing optimization, you need to know the direction where to go. Then this actually also much better. So this gives a much better result than this one, in some cases. Let me just uh, tell you a uh, little bit about uh, simple update. Okay. Simple update is actually uh, just a, a very simple way to determine local tensors. Okay. As I mentioned, one way is to projection, another way is to minimize this quantity, but use simple entanglement mean field approximation. So the, the, the mean field here, the, the field, the mean field here is a entanglement spectrum. Okay? It's not just a just a scalar, it's actually a vector. So the field here, the field here is just a scalar, uh, it's a vector. Um, let me just uh, 
For example, here I just uh, introduced on each bond, we assume that there is an entanglement spectrum vector on each bond. Okay. So that's the, the approximation where the approximation comes from. Okay. So this is theta x, lambda y, gamma z are nothing but the entanglement spectrum. It's a vector. <coughs> um, one can determine this vector by solving this kind of uh, um, quasi-canonical equations. <coughs> Those canonical equations actually are exact on the basic lattice, but on the regular lattice, they are not exact. They are just simple as much. <coughs> So by solving this equation, in principle, we can determine the theta and uh, all these kind of bound vectors, and also optimize this tensor itself. Okay? So that's actually uh, how this kind of method works. Okay? Of course, um, this equation can be solved in many ways. The simplest way is to do projection. Okay, just, uh, you just optimize that. Then the, when they converge, then you can find that it satisfies this equation automatically. There's another way is to directly solve this equation, just like from the beginning. You assume that this is a parameter, this is another parameter, it can say it's, but uh, you just, uh, when you, whenever, you call it, whenever you do this kind of things, then of course you have to uh, consider the homotony itself. And solve this question. Okay. To determine this theta, lambda, and all the tensors. So that's the idea. Okay. So this is a very standard mean field kind of approach. The only difference between this kind of for entanglement mean, mean field approach and other kind of things that here this is this uh, this uh, mean field is actually is actually not a physical directly physical measurable quantity. It's not all the parameter, it's no sense. It's just a, uh, an entanglement field uh, which is uh, introduced on the basin atoms. So uh, suppose that we have the phase transition mm -hmm. in this uh, kind of system. Then uh, that phase transition always uh, has a mean field type uh, similarity or something else? Um, that's a good question, because uh, this is not a standard mean field. Right. So this is entanglement, entanglement mean field. So I don't know the answer for your question. Okay. Uh, it turns out, it seems that you, uh, it can't go beyond the mean field, the standard mean field things. <coughs> but I don't know why. Yeah, I don't know why. Yeah, that's a very good question. Maybe the region something. where you find the mean field type behavior is very, very narrow. In the outside of the region, you, you might observe something. <laughs> yeah, it could be. Could be. Yeah, could be. Yeah. But we haven't really, I, I have, I, 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 we haven't really think this very carefully about this kind of thing. Um, well, I have a question. Yeah. What is the canonical condition for 2D practice? So no, for 2D, there's no canonical equation. No, you can't define canonical condition. This is a canonical uh, equation on the beta matrix. Mm -hmm. Because on beta matrix, so you cut one bond separating in two parts. Then that, in that case, the canonical condition can be well defined. Mm -hmm. And so that's there uh, for the, this is a, so if it's uh, on the regular matrix, I show this is not a canonical, it's just it's a quasi canonical equation. Now let me just uh, tell you a little bit more about the beta matrix. This is beta lattice. Then, uh, because on the beta lattice, uh, uh, an important property is that the size on the boundary is actually of the same order as in the bulk. So the, the number of sides on the boundary is actually the number of sides on the internal. Actually, they're almost the same. That's of the same order. Then, that's actually cause a problem. For example, if we want to convert this kind of sense into a regular lattice, 
then we define distance. On the um, regular lattice, we define lattice uh, parameter of the, 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 the length of two, the two sides, R. Then, if you want to convert into a beta lattice, it turns out here it's R and it's just log, log R. Okay? So that's very important. Okay. So this is a, just a, we just a, do a simple convert between these two kinds of distance between regular lattice and beta lattice. That's actually very important. For example, if it's a correlation function on beta lattice, which just changes exponentially, or decay exponentially, but it may just become power law decay on the regular lattice. Okay? So it's, <laughs> it's a very strange thing. Um, this is actually very important because if you calculate, for example, uh, some magnetic susceptibility based on this quantity uh, on this beta net, because of this uh, rotation symmetry, if you assume the system has a rotation symmetry, then this is a uh, this is a spin spin correlation function. Sorry. It's actually just uh, uh, just given by this quantity and times a uh, factor n. n is the number of sides on this uh, uh, nth layer of this is a beta lattice. For example, in the case of this is a one point in the middle is uh, just uh, just n equals zero. Then there's three sides on the first layer and more layer more sides on the second layer and more sides on the third layer. So then. So this nr is, is uh, generally a function of, uh, is a uh, proportion to q minus one. Q here is three, and times r. Okay. Now if we convert to this one, if we assume this is ex decay exponentially, okay, just a correlation function here decay exponentially on beta matrix, then this quantity actually can be described by this expression. So this magnetic susceptibility actually, if this quantity becomes positive, if it becomes positive, then this quantity will diverge when R goes infinity, right? So this means that uh, correlation lens here, this correlation lens on beta lattice, will never be larger than this one. Will never be, because if it's larger than that one this one where they worked. So the correlation lens on the beta analysis is always upper bounded, it's finite. Okay? Of course this is a this this is a one dimension that's no, no problem because Q equal to two. This is one dimension. But if it's uh, more than Q is more than two, then it is always uh, Upper bounded. Okay. So this is um, let me just give you an example. For example, this is a, a transverse AC model on the Q equal to uh, three beta lattice. This is not equal to Q to three beta lattice. Uh, you can see there's a phase transition here. Okay. There's Field. And you also can calculate the correlation lens. The correlation lens is a local to one over local two. Okay, this is one over local two. I don't know why this comes. And so it never goes beyond this uh, threshold. And also the entanglement entropy is also upper bounded. Okay. So the beta line has a very simple property. Okay. So the, for the beta analysis, you can get a very good estimation for almost every quantity, or physical quantity, very easily. Because the entanglement entropy is very low. Okay. It's a critical system. This is critical, right? 
it's critical system for quiz. Uh, final for resonance, final entanglement. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Why, why does it not diverge? I mean, at the critical point, the this, this one? Right. Oh, you, you were diver diverged. And this is just because uh, if you increase uh, their bound dimension, then it might become sharper, sharper. Okay, oh, really? Yeah. I see. I see. No, because uh, here, we, you need more points here. Because as as I'm oh, sorry, as I show you here, when the correlation is reach this uh, quick, quick, uh, just uh, uh, reach this upper bound, it will diverge. Mm -hmm. So the system can still become critical, but uh, the correlation <coughs> is, is always upper bounded, and entanglement is also upper bounded. Okay, and that's for some update. So no. Sorry. Uh, so if you apply the simple with the regular, <coughs> like this system, one yes. topic, so I, I likely feel that the wave function itself is the uh, same with the wave function of the bed Yeah. Is that That's right. So the, only the difference is just uh, So the correlation is maybe bigger than this one. There's an upper bound for correlation is, but it's still short range. Okay. Yes. And because the wave function has a short range character. Only this value may not be in there. Okay? There's an upper bound for that. Can be can go beyond this value, but uh, still short range correlated. So simple update always gives you a uh, short range correlated wave function. Um, now I just tell you about uh, your four update. Four update is actually basically to for example, just started from a uh, function here, initial function, we just want to get a new tensor level stage which minimizes this, uh, minimize this function. So that's the purpose. Okay, that's the purpose. Um, one can minimize this quantity by just our standard version of principle. Just, just do this, minimize this function, okay? Many, many, many times. The trouble is that this kind of minimization works very good at the first few steps. For example, this of how this works ground state energy. At the beginning, it indeed drops quite fast. However, if you go, that iteration goes further and further, <coughs> actually, you are saying, this is the best way from here. If you stop here, it's okay but you don't know where to stop, right? Then you keep going. Then you eventually you find that ground state energy goes up. Very strange. Very unexpected, but very strange. This property is in common with No, this is a fault date. Yeah. No, you simple update, there's no problem. You simple update, it just goes, <coughs> goes just uh, uh, directly. The, the, the thing is, so C number for the first order <coughs> function corresponding to the... No, yeah, of course, after you get this quantity, you renormalize it. You renormalize it, so then you do this calculation. Yeah. Uh, as a one step, you don't need to do this normalization mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning. So I have an question, why uh, the advantage shows such kinds of non-monotonic uh, behavior in the I don't really know, but this is a very, very common thing, okay? Almost every time we get this kind of things, <laughs> okay? Almost every time, okay? If you do the prop date, you will have a same, same, same experience. Except if you don't look at the, this step, you just, just, when you convert, you get the results, you get rid of the results. Now you can, of course, you, you, you will miss this kind of thing. But if you follow the step, you are saying, okay. Or at the beginning, you say, oh, oh it's good. Convert. Then if you do more iteration, <coughs> then you find that, oh, the energy becomes worse. It's not like this kind of fluctuation if you just go this way, this way. That means it's not convert. It still converts. 
If we become converged, goes this way, I should say, now convert just to a higher energy. So the difference is not very big, I should say. I'm wondering but that it's, which, is, which answer is the correct in the computation. How can we um, find the... Just because uh, this is a refunction that satisfies version of principle, in principle this one is better than this one. Right? Yeah, yes. So that's the only thing we can trust is that, okay? So some people just stop here. They find the minimum, then just stop. I have a concern, but I mean, there's nothing that says that the minimum energy is the best criterion for the best trade function, right? No, of I, course, I, I you agree with you. Taste, that. But this shows that you, you use another criterion and then the energy is not minimized for, for that criterion. You're right, yeah. They're just because uh, the minimization is done for this uh, thing. This is not energy, okay? So that's why you, you get, so this is uh, the state that minimizes this quantity. Not an energy. Okay? If you want to minimize energy, well, of course you will not get this consent. You always get monotonic decay. Just because this is not an energy itself. Okay? So you may get some converged energy, then eventually it goes up. Okay. But anyway, I still believe that this one should be better than this one in energy, okay. at least. Okay. So no, same. Just sir, uh, it goes <coughs> down, it goes up. <coughs> very common, very common. Just because sir, uh, the minimize of the quantity is another energy, is this one. Okay. If you want to minimize energy, you will never see this kind of thing. Can you say that uh, this one is approaching one of some excited states? No, it's, I think it's a mixing ground state and. Uh, Oh, yes. it's, it's not an exact state. Exact state. Uh, exact uh, state. What about the value it for tau? Um, it doesn't depend on tau very much. Generally, uh, in order to uh, reduce this kind of sense, so generally, if we just uh, make tau smaller, tau smaller means that we have more step. But eventually, if you increase this, uh, reach after reach this minimum, you always see this kind of up to. <coughs> okay. And the convergent value seems doesn't much uh, how the uh, how tau is is is, is used. Okay. It can be small and it can be big. But of course, if the tau is too big, then error is very big. But we generally can use a relatively small. But the error must be coming from the procedure to operate e to minus tau h. That's right. You're right. Yes. Yeah. So some kind of approximation cost. Um, because uh, uh, I think that just because this quantity is not exactly the energy itself, mm -hmm. it's a tau square h square, so that's actually error bar. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So is this is this a finding d effect? Uh, I, um, I mean, in principle, if d is large, it should be the same when you minimize the energy. You are right. This kind of ten becomes smaller, smaller if d goes bigger and bigger. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if B, D equals to infinity in principle, I think it is very rich. Even if uh, that's up 10, then up 10 is invisible. If D is very big. So you see that? Yeah, that's right. So this is for D equals 3? Um, and this is D equals 3. Yes, if sir. you increase D, you can see it's all it also, it also gives up a chair slower. Okay. <coughs> I probably want to like comment a little bit. So yeah. according to Philip Popper's, yeah. if you like, you get this behavior, then you can reduce the bond dimension a little, and then increase bond dimension. This behavior, in many cases, will disappear. Um, I, I don't think so. I think once you just uh, if you just use just keep it in that bond dimension, it goes a longer time than always do this way. I think just he, he just uh, he next. Or well, I think what he did is actually just go here and jump in and it goes here and stop. So if you change the parameter frequently, of yeah. course you can do that. But uh, I mean, if you just keep that parameter uh, unchanged and like just the iteration, it works. Yeah, for a long time, then yeah. it's always. Good. I think just because of this quantity is not energy itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I often see this behavior from the simple object, especially when uh, uh, when the optimization is stuck from very fixed fixed configuration. Oh really? Yes. 
we, I really um, meant to All right. I, I, I didn't really say this kind of sense in simple update. I don't know. I, um, uh, my, my, myself, I didn't say this kind of sense in simple update. I think simple update is, is relatively uh, stable. But I think also the initial condition is very important. For example, if I start from the random university, yeah. then this behavior, yeah, often I see, but mostly it always monotonically increased. Uh -huh. But uh, yes, as I said, if we fix the university very for a very specific contribution, then we often see this kind of. All right. Behavior. Okay. I see. I see. I see. I, I okay. think even in the case of simple. I yeah. Yeah, I think they will also you should also be behaving this way. If you just follow this very for a long time, yes. If you, of course <coughs> many people just stop you know, roughly somewhere uh, somewhere here and people generally stop. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wanted to say that even if you use a simplified update, yeah. you may have been this kind of thing. Uh, yeah, there's no principle uh, preventing this kind of thing happen. But uh, I mean, in, in, in our calculation, or maybe we didn't use, say this kind of thing so very uh, seriously. So maybe we missed this kind of thing. Anyway, so this is a uh, um, four update, and generally the problem one may meet. So just be careful with this kind of thing. So problem people just people just uh, stop here. Okay. But again, I don't think you have to worry because you know we always use the energy as some criteria because we have a variational principle. But if you look at some other quantity, it may very well be better at the end than uh, you know when the energy is minimized. Yeah, uh, I don't really say this should be uh, very much, but uh, this is just I want to say this is a this is a factor of uh, that one may encounter. Of course, if you, if you want to use the energy as a measure of how good your calculation is, then you can worry about it. But if you are interested in some other property, there's nothing that says that minimizing the energy is the, always the best thing to do. Yeah, right, right. But I think... The, and you have another criteria, right? Which is for, for, uh, I should say this way. For example, if you want to minimize some quantity, or optimize some quantity, yeah. you just add this cross function, that part of every function, then right. do the minimization. Yeah. Then, that will generally give a better estimation for that quantity. For that quantity. Yeah. So here, uh, what I want to say is that this kind of things may not be the optimized approach for energy. Yeah. Okay, that's what I want to say. Anyway, then let's consider minimization of the energy itself. Okay. Then this is a different kind of approach. This is a comparison for this uh, square lattice uh, Heisenberg model. Okay. So this is, a, uh, this is a simple update. This is a, uh, the full update from, OK? This is a minimization of uh, energy obtained by cobalt. This is a right one, red right, uh, triangle. And this is a full update again. But there is more careful. Just, just stop the minimum and then stop, OK? So this is the energy. Okay. So <coughs> this is a, is one. So this is a full update, but you just stop it to the minimum that uh, that curve. Okay. Then this is uh, the result we recently obtained by minimizing this quantity with uh, automa automatic differentiation. Okay. So this is one. Um, so. Um, So this uh, uh, this kind of things are uh, uh, applied to uh, cancer analysis where we uh, my colleague uh, Haiju Nell will give a talk um, next week. So this kind of in detail sense. But here I just a brief mention about this um, automatic differentiation. Um, it's basically to calculate. Uh, uh, for example, if you want to calculate uh, uh, some quantity as a function of theta, the derivative. But you, in real calculation, there are many steps we have to go. Okay? Then this, this quantity depends on the derivative at every step. Um, in, in most of our calculation, we generally ignore the middle part, the intermediate step. 
we do this kind of calculation. But in this case, as we do now the Dirac theory at every step, then we just do the numeric differentiation. So that's generally people do. But in the automatic differentiation, instead of to, to calculate this quantity um, just from the, from the differences, from the differences, actually we calculate each quantity is kind of dirty. Um, just using the formula, mathematical formula, exactly. Of course, there's a machine error, okay? I mean, except the machine error, there's no error in this formula. So this is actually a, a, a very uh, a new technique that has been widely used in machine learning, okay? Um, also very successful, because, okay? So that, that <coughs> is now uh, quite a a number of um, network, networks has been uh, established for doing these kind of calculations. Uh, but in real calculations, generally, instead of for to do the calculation uh, this way, generally start from this side, first calculate this one, this, this one, then calculate this one, going this way, generally, actually, you would do this calculation this way. Okay. So this is like a forward propagation, and this is like a backward propagation. <coughs> because uh, if we do this way, then you have to remember every step in the middle step. But if we do this way, it's actually, you don't need to analyze. So this is in practical calculation, generally, calculation is done this way. This is called back propagation. This is very like SRG. Okay. So the idea is uh, that, or the idea are very similar. Anyway, I will not tell you what the detailed things about this, how this uh, things works. But uh, it's called calculation is done. The good thing is that uh, this kind of things for most of the functions is already uh, has already been built in the network, so you don't need to write down everything from the beginning. Okay, you just now give the uh, this error what it is, the error is what this theta is. And then, of course. You, you need to tell the, the step of the things, and then you can call the, the standard number to get the, get the results. And uh, also, this is a, uh, so the, this kind of things can achieve machine, uh, machine precision when you do the, uh, when you calculate the differential <coughs> radius, regions. And the cost is not a really much from uh, extended method okay, from the uh, differences. Just uh, maybe a factor of two increases. It's not a very big increase in of course. The good thing is that uh, using this sort of kind of approach, you can directly calculate any kind of uh, regions, any order of differential values. For example, you can calculate specific heat directly from the beginning. Because uh, if you if you don't do this uh, generally, if you, you have to calculate your internal energy, then from the difference in internal energy uh, divided by the uh, the difference in the temperature, you can get uh, a specific heat. That's the the way we did it before. But with this kind of automatic differentiation, you can calculate specific heat directly using another formula. Okay, so that's a good thing. Okay. I just here just show you a good example. It's two dimensional asymptote. Okay. Just with this uh, TRG. And you can also get a much more accurate estimation for the wave function itself. For example, for this uh, gap is a uh, uh, model. model, uh, if you use a uh, standard way to do the calculation, this is uh, the result we obtained. So, this is the uh, exact result. This is a fault date. This is a minimization part. So the accuracy is much better for this. Uh, because for this model, it's a very difficult to get a very accurate estimation for any kind of quantities. We tried that many, many times. But uh, the this result we all obtained before. It's the best result. We never think this is good enough. 
Yes. Uh, flux is pi. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, I can't remember. That this should be yeah. zero. Okay. Well, either zero pi or I can't remember. This is very accurate. That one. Uh, what, the, what type of initial tensor did you use in this calculation? Uh, pardon? Uh, what is the initial tensor? What's the initial tensor? Mm How -hmm. oh, initial? Just, uh, just perhaps. Just, yeah. just uh, highly complex. Uh, sorry. Uh, just, oh, initial tensor. Yeah. I just random random tensor. Random tensor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, for for four update, it maybe starts from a uh, simple update, but here is uh, just random. Because the hard one is comparable with uh, variation method, like variation update instead of four update. Um, we didn't compare with that, but uh, because the, the, that code is very difficult to write. Okay. 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 So, uh, after that, I guess. I think it's a, this is not different from the variation of things. It just means that this one, you can write the code very easily. So, yeah. How many yes. initial states did you try? Yeah. For this one, is there uh, just initial states dependent or something like that? Uh, no. Random, random initial states. No, yeah, yeah. Did you just try single initial state or did you? Try many types of random initial state and just pick up the lowest energy. Um, I can't remember because this is uh, done by myself. Uh, I think there he tried a few, but not many. Okay. Not much difference. Okay, if you start from different functions. Uh, I think more important is uh, if you calculate magnetization. Okay, for this quantity, we know that that's the magnetization. This is significant magnetization free. But if we use a full update, you get a very small magnetization, but not zero. Okay, not zero. But uh, use this kind of minimization, then you can get uh, almost the same zero. Of course, there's very tiny number. It depends on the initial states. Do you know why even it uh, extremely small magnetization? Uh, this this number is always reduced when you do the iteration more and more, more times. It becomes smaller, 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 yeah, smaller. But it's not constant. I mean, it, you didn't import any constraint. No. So, no. so the, because the initial state uh, has a finite amount of moments. Yeah. So now when you do the iteration, then it becomes smaller, smaller, smaller. Small. Yeah, but it will never I, vanish. I'd like to know the reason, physical reason, why yeah. did you get the better result with uh, AD? Um, just because uh, you, you, you optimize the state more accurately. The optimization is done more accurately. And that's the only reason. Another way of asking, um, the automatic differentiation mm. reduce the problem of long range and long moment problem. For instance, the, just at a critical point, Yes. Uh, how the accuracy is improved with automatic differentiation. Um, I do not exactly get that answer. This model we study is actually, uh, you can consider it as a critical system, okay. because there's no gap. Um, I, we, we do not the improvement without the AD or with AD. But with AD, generally, uh, the, the, the reason we use that is just because of the, code, the code is much, much simpler than the code wrote by Cobalt. Because in order to do this uh, conventional minimization, Cobalt has to write down a, a huge program in order to do this. Mm -hmm. e even in that case, the, each calculation, for each uh, just, uh, calculation, there's an error, a cumulative error. Because there's a many, many uh, just uh, calculation he has to be done independently. But then it is meaning that uh, AD yeah. somehow efficiently taking account part of long range and That's right, yeah. automatic. And uh, what is that the physical um, mechanism? Also? I don't know exactly. The, the, uh, even just uh, without AD, the, 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 the non range non -range entanglement has, has been considered by minimization of energy. But in that kind of sense, uh, there are two things which uh, missing <coughs> without AD. One is that uh, at each calculation, because each part of the derivative is done separately and <coughs> just uh, not exactly. So there's a cumulative error. 
in that uh, calculation of de derivatives. So the optimization, just the direction, is not optimized in at each of the optimization step. But uh, with AD, then that actually is, can be done while okay. So that's a reason. So that's why this will function. Uh, I think this will function is more, much more accurate than this one. Okay. That's right. So when you optimize, do you take, uh, when you take the differentiation? Yeah. Could you take the derivative of the uh, measurement of the local connection or local connection? At the form. Yeah. Then maybe uh, you should. Contract because the our co here we use the translation symmetry. Yes, but the full Hamiltonian, I think, for Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian is should be taken into account, like a physical boson. Yeah, without AD, yes, you have to do that way. With AD, you don't need to do that. That's a advantage, I should say. Yes. Only the measurement of the local Hamiltonian is enough. Because this is a translation word. Because it is translated in work. Yeah, and that's why I say this is much more, uh, much better way to do minimization. Uh, yeah, basically, we can, we can hide the derivative of the whole analysis of the x. Yes. Like, uh, you're right. This is a, this is a good thing because. Uh, where when uh, if you use conventional way to do the calculation, you have to consider long-range detections. Uh, well, the Hamiltonian, you have to consider these kind of things. That's right, actually why the <coughs> calculation takes a long time and also not accurate, because uh, that sense is generally not a very accurate calculation. But here, no problem. You can do that calculation by just calculating local quantities. It's also applicable to the domain. They are automatically embedded, embedded in their derivatives. Okay. So you are using a corner transfer matrix uh, formalism for doing this calculation. I mean, uh, when you when you do the uh, when you contract when you contract the tensor, uh, yes. I see. I see. And then after that, you you apply conjugate gradient type optimization. Uh, I don't know exactly the method we yeah. use for the uh, optimization, but that's a standard uh, subroutine. Could it be just a uh, conjugate version? Okay, I see. Okay, um, so now my move to the, the, the of calculation of the. Oh, I already used up all my time, right? So I should uh, slow it down. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, um, this actually, uh, let me just stop uh, after I finish here about this part, okay. Um, this is actually mostly difficult part in, the, in all the tensor calculations. Because the reason we cannot uh, use a very large bound dimension just because this quantity costs very high, the calculation, okay. So, because uh, even in the minimization of the, of the energy, we need to calculate this kind of quantity. So this kind of calculation, the cost is high just because uh, when we, whenever we do these calculations, we need to contract two tensor narrow space. So this is, uh, this is one, this is a function, and we need also a bra and a cat. Then this means that uh, we have to contract this one. The standard way is to first trace out uh, these are uh, physical bounds, these are vertical bounds. Then we get your new tensor narrow space. This is actually the bound dimension is square. So that's actually the problem. If bound dimension D is five, then it's 24. So actually, this is a very big increase in this one. So whenever people use to contract this uh, tensor narrow using CTMRG or use uh, ITBD, whatever the method use, this bound dimension is too big. 5 is still small, but if it digs to 10, then it's 100. Okay? That's a very big number. So the computational cost in order to contract this tensor is roughly this, this order. 
Of course, you can write a very smart code to reduce this uh, exponent from 12 to 11 or to 10, even, but still quite a big number. So it's very difficult to let it go beyond, uh, for example, 13. Okay. There's another approach instead of uh, trace out uh, this physical bound, we actually press the upper layer, shift it by half the unit cell, and press the down. So that become uh, this uh, uh, nested tensor network. In this case, the bound dimension, the maximum bound dimension is still D. Okay? Then we contract this bound in this tensor network space using CQMRG or TEBD or any kind of missing method. This can significantly reduce the cost. Okay? Um, it converges slower than the double layer approach, but uh, the cost is much more lower. So that's the approach in principle one should use if you, if you want to write uh, this kind of code in order to, to divide this um, So. Anyway, so um, I should I think I should stop here. Right. There are so many questions already, but uh, if you would like to ask some further questions, uh, go ahead. Have you missed in catching the okay, in the case of uh, uh, the Holman differentiation? And are you saying that uh, that can be used? Or the case of long range uh, yeah, it doesn't matter what and how long the how long the injection is. It's, uh, if you use the transition variance, you just need to calculate in principle just one unit set. Yeah, the original one term. Original tensor network algorithm. Yeah, has some. Because in order to calculate the derivative in the original algorithm, you have to consider it's uh, not non range detection, just non range correlation. Okay, so in that case, it's very difficult. You have to calculate this quantity at every step for all, all the kind of correlations. Just start from one, one side and connect it to any other sides. You have to calculate this quantity. So that's, uh, that's, also, that's actually a quite uh, cost, it's very high. Another thing is that every time you do this calculation, there's error bar. The, the, the far, the, the, the um, if the distance between two sides is very far, then the, the actually the error is big, bigger. So there's cumulating error. Um, but if you use a, a, a automatic differentiation, then you don't need to worry about it. Okay. How about the case where the transformational symmetry is broken? All right, not, uh, this, then you need to calculate every local quantity, every site, still cheaper than you have to calculate, or you have to, in principle, you have to calculate every, every point. Uh, in that case, it also depends on the open um, system. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. In that case, uh, we will perform the renormation group for uh, imaginary kind of evolution operator, right? Yes. Uh, if so, the, uh, to make the chalk error, uh, mm. uh, the count of uh, imaginary time axis is much, much smaller than the real time axis. But, and the uh, uh, resulting tensor, the normal tensor is the very, very anisotropic tensor. Mm. I haven't fully understood the question. Can you say again? Oh. Uh, My question is uh, that maybe the normal tensor is very, very anisotropic tensor. Uh, in that case, is the uh, naive approximate, naive application of uh, TLG is successful? Oh, you mean if the tensor is not isotopic, right? Or not symmetric? Is that what you mean? Uh, the uh, imaginary time operator. Oh, right. You mean in the TRG, right? Uh, yes. Then because uh, uh, along the time direction and the spatial yes, direction yes, are yes, different, right? Different. Yeah. Uh, uh, but in principle, you can still do these kind of things. Uh, but more careful, you have to optimize this uh, transition 
In that case, it's not um, uh, generally it's not a unitary matrix when you do the transformation. You need to consider uh, canonical transformation, transformation matrix. So the, the optimization becomes more complicated. This is like in the quantum transfer matrix transition from method. And in that case, uh, um, for example, if you calculate density matrix, that density matrix may not be positive definite. So you need to be very much more careful. Yeah. Actually, in the in the calculation of CTMRG, for all these kinds of contraction of um, this kind of tensors, you always encounter that problem because uh, it's always not symmetric. So the density matrix, if you, if you define the density matrix, is not, is always not symmetric, not even positive definite. So if you're still using this uh, DMRG-like idea to do the truncation, you should be very careful. Okay, thank you again. Right. Thank you.